My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. SRB Media. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Paul. Good to speak to you again. Absolutely. Welcome all to our Legends of the 70s podcast. Then we've done five before. We've done two Morty's mixtapes, so we're going to be talking about vinyl a little bit later on in the podcast. Champions of Europe Part 1 and Part 2, when you conquered Europe in 1982, and the class of 81. This is the six in our double trilogy, and we're going to take a trip <laughs> down memory lane and Possibly just drop off at a pub and have a have a, a drink or two. But before we do that, I do want to talk about your book, The Full Morty. A fantastic read. Thank you for sending it, sir. Sorry I couldn't attend that evening, but the wife hadn't been very well. And I, I just couldn't make it. So let's start with the book. You must be very proud. And Richard uh, Sydenham, let's give his surname as well. Yes. You've done a fantastic job there. Yeah, I, you know, it was um, it was a book I wanted to bring out, Paul, uh, you know, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, but I just kept putting it off. I just thought there was more to say. Uh, and then, you know, I got to this ripe old age of 70. Uh, and I just thought, well, you know, we, we, we've had the, the celebration of the 40 years of winning the European Cup and the league. And I just thought it'd be nice to, to actually sort of finish it all off with my own story. Uh, you know, and and not just the story about winning the league and the European Cup, but but the stories before that, you know, and and really that's how it came about. And uh, it was interesting. The title, the title was an interesting start because um, when we first started it with Richard, he, he you know he thought, well, have you got an idea for a title? And I had two titles, but I don't think you could have two titles on a book. But I'll, I'll tell you what the two titles were. The, the, the first, because it wasn't a book about, you know, both when I started at Coventry and then obviously with the villa, uh, I, I, I sort of had two titles. One was called Sent to Coventry, which actually is a, a title of one of the chapters. I just thought it fitted, you know, because, uh, you know, as I say in the book, you know, where's Coventry? You know, gosh, I didn't know where that was. And then the other one was was obviously Ron Saunders' mantra, you know, at the, in his programme notes about about going out and playing. He said, just give me 110%, you know, and... And basically, they were my titles, but, you know, I, Richard just thought they were a bit too long-winded. He came up with one which I didn't like at all, yeah? And uh, and I thought, no, we're not going with that, Richard. We're going to have to find another one. So I just happened to be talking to Andy Blair one day, and uh, I was just saying to Andy, we were having a chat, and I just mentioned to him about writing a book and stuff like that. And I said, Lisa, I'm not happy with the title I've got at the moment. I need a new one. And you know, just off the top of his head, he just went, why don't you call it the full Morty? But that, and I thought, that's a light bulb moment, isn't it? That's Andy Blair though, isn't it? Andy Blair. Yeah. That you know. is Andy Blair in a nutshell. And he, and he came up with that. And I thought, crikey, that's good. So, the next thing now is to try to persuade the uh, publishers and also Richard, you know, that that was the title I wanted. It didn't take much persuading because I just said, look, that's the title for my book. No questions about it. Get that one down. <laughs> and that was it. And that's how we got the name. So I, I just thought it just fitted the bill, really, Paul. Yeah, yeah the full Morty. Yeah. And and I think it, it's a great play on the full Monty and the full Morty. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's you, when you look at it, you actually you you look at the title, you go the full Morty. I actually want to read this book because it suggests that it might be a little bit comical a, a, as well. Um, <laughs> there's another book that's out now. It's called Cockaroop. It's about Les Cocker. And I just think they're very very clever titles. 
And I think yes. that having a title that is clever and one that works is fantastic. Andy Blair really is. He's as sharp as a tack, is no, He's always on his toes. He does the after-dinner circuit, and he's done many events, hosted many events for you guys uh, at the uh, bar, Britannia Bar in Wollaston that I've attended quite yes, a few myself. Yes. And he is very clever, very sharp, and really followed in the footsteps of uh, Dennis Mortimer because your career started at Coventry. He followed you pretty much into Coventry, and then he, he come to the Villa, and um, sadly you'd won the European Cup, and there was still yes. a lot of uh, a lot of uh, miles left in Dennis Mortimer. But very similar yeah. players, weren't you, you and Andy? You got a great, you know, camaraderie as well now um, yeah. after you finish your careers. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, we always kept in touch, obviously, yeah. as you well know about the European Cup side, mm-hmm. because then the league championship, well, the European Cup, because Andy wasn't there for the league. But yeah. we've, we, we've stayed uh, pretty close because we live in the area, yes. you know, so it, it was always good. But as you say, Andy, Andy, when he finished playing, you know, we took up this sort of, the second sort of stri- uh, stream of, of working, which was, was, was uh, Austin, you know, sort of Q&As and everything. Yeah. And... Uh, he had a real master who he learned from. It was a comedian who he used to go, and I've seen him a few times. I can't remember his name now, but he, he, he I think he got all his punchlines and his timing from that comedian. And that's what you need sometimes, you know, when you you want to be something like that. It's 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 either you've you've already got it or you're learning from someone else. But when you learn from a master. And this this comedian was really good, you know, at sort of uh, doing that kind of stuff. I think Andy learned an awful lot from him, and that's why he's so impressive now, you know. And he he does a good job. He really he really does. Absolutely, and I think you're right. Learning from the master, and I think it's so important for players to stay in the game educate the next generation and let them kids learn from players that have done it, that have worn that shirt and have won honours, in not just for the club, but in the game of football. Who was your heroes growing up, Dennis? Because we're going to start with your upbringing, your early days. But when Dennis Mortimer was a young kid kicking cans round Merseyside or Liverpool, um, that's where you were born, or Stones yes. or a tennis ball, who did you want to be? Because you were a big Liverpool fan, wasn't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, we I tell the story in that first chapter, yeah. you know, about, uh, you know, growing up in the shadow of the Beatles. And, uh, it, it, you know, there was a there, there was a, uh, quite a few connections, really, you know, to that sort of period, you know, the Beatles and my dad, what he did sometimes as a part time job. And and I I just wished I'd have spoken to my dad a little bit more before he passed away about, you know, his life as a roadie, yeah. you know, looking after a band. But but I I never got around to that. So I, I I had to get that information from one of my brothers. And and the other thing as well, but you know, I mean, I did leave Liverpool at fifteen, and 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 you know, ended up in Coventry, and and really I've I've stayed in the Midlands ever since. You know, so so you know, but my other brothers, they were closer, obviously, to my dad as he grew up, and they grew older, and they started asking questions and everything, you know. But uh, but my no, my dad, he, he took us to Liverpool. Uh, he used to go and stand on the cop. Uh, we used to go in the boys' pen. Uh, it was only uh, a shilling, the old shilling in those days, five p. I think my dad used to pay off a crown, you know, to get into the cop. You know, but we had a great view. It was, it, it was. We didn't have any any problems, you know, in that area as well. You know, <laughs> used to find quite a few of the kids wanted to climb over the fence into the cop, and I kept on wondering, you know, why do you want to go in there for crying out loud? You know, the the place was it was just ram packed. You know, I mean, the, listen, the, the 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 ground, the gates were closed at two o'clock. Yeah, you know, and those fans were in there. It was a full house. In you know, in the standing areas and all that, it was a full house for an hour before the game, and you, know, you can imagine the you know the the crowd and everything and the the, the singing and and the movement and everything that you, you we see we've seen so often about the cop, but but that was where my sort of I started to you know sort of get to to know my heroes and you know which were which which came to pass and. Uh, and and you know later on in my life I I sort of uh, I played with a couple of them or I got managed by one of them and I played with one of those heroes and you know and it was um, it, it was an interesting time and it was a time when Shankly took over yeah 
Shankly, it, it, you know, it came down to Liverpool and he took over a team and he turned it into, you know, a uh, great... And he always reminds me, well, Ron always reminded me, Ron Saunders always reminded me of Bill Shankly, you know, and, and the way he went about his job uh, and, and his matter-of-factness. And so so the, the, the heroes, the, my heroes really were probably uh, Ian Callaghan and Peter Thompson yeah. in those days, you know, both wingers, you know, playing in a, a 4-2-4 system as it was then. And those two guys, you know, they, they, they got you out of your seats with the, the runs they made and the chat, you know, and the, and the crosses they put in and the, you know, and, and it was just, a, it was just magic watching them play it, you know, because Shankly had come in now and turn that team into something really special. And for, for three or four years, you know, when I started watching them, probably about the age 12, you know, and going to the match, for those three or four years, what I saw, you know, uh, you know, watching them play was just some amazing memories, you know, and uh, I, I suppose I suppose the, the greatest memory would have been going up to Hampden Park yeah. to watch them play in the uh, European Cup Winners' Cup final. I think it was against Antrek Frankfurt. And um, they lost the game 2 once, and it wasn't a particularly great performance by Liverpool. But <laughs> here's, here's me now, a, a kid of 14 now, who's, a, who's, who, who's taking a day off school, yeah, because the game was played on a Thursday. He's taking a day off school to get up to Amden Park, travelling on the coach. No, no motorways in those days, you know. Everything's done on dual carriageways and everything. So imagine that journey, uh, you know, so... We get we get up there probably just before the game started, and then we came straight back straight after it. I got home at six o'clock that next morning. We got home, went into the house, had a, had some breakfast, and went to school. I had one day off, so my mum had to give me a she had to give me a, a letter off because I wasn't feeling too well, which is a normal thing. So I think that was the only day I ever had off school. Yeah. No. Just going a bit no. muffled, Dennis. You've gone away from me a little bit. Sorry, mate. I think it's probably sometimes where where I am in the house. Is there any better? Uh, no. Can, any chance you're going back to where you was when we started? Yeah, no. Well, no, I'm in the same. I'm in the oh, same. Right. But this, this this always happens to me. At this, I I, I don't know. I, I get ten minutes of good <laughs> connection. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. You're loud and clear again. We can just yeah, I, a little bit. Yeah. Out yeah, I get about ten minutes of good connection, and then it just goes away. Yeah, it's living in the country, you see. Yeah, that's yep, what it's all about. Absolutely. Yeah. Your mother was your mother sporty, because your dad's name no. was Joe, wasn't it? Joe Morton. Yeah, yeah, your mom's Joseph. Was, your mum's name was Mary, wasn't it? Yeah. So I start, I start, <laughs> I start the book off the first yeah, chapter. I know. I started off with that. I think it's 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 quite interesting. To, you know, when, when I, I won't say what it says in the first in the first chapter, but but it, it's a <laughs> it's an interesting play on Joseph and Mary, really. Yeah, yeah you know, if, if, if you're religious things, yeah, you know. But uh, no, I, I mean, mum was mum wasn't sporty. Mum had to look after us. Listen, you know, you know when you you know when you you look back and you you, you sort of think about. You know the times that we had. You know when uh, everything was everything was a struggle. You know for you know growing up. You know your mother had to sort of make ends meet. Uh, come Friday, she never had a penny in her purse, and we'd have to wait for my dad to come home. You know with his with his wage packet. Uh, give me give. Give give us some money to go round to the fish and chip shop and get some fish and chips, you know. It, it was like that every week, you know. And uh, but listen, it, we had a in a way we had a fabulous time because there was no, you know, there was there was there was no very few cars on the road. And you know when you you lived in a little neighbourhood where you could sort of play football in the street all the time yeah. because there was nothing going on and, and and you know those days were great you know and you could be out on the street till 10 o'clock at night mm-hmm. and you know on your street that is you know, plenty of plenty of lights you know we were playing football still under the lights and everything but you know we, we were th- we might be there till 10 o'clock especially in the summer you know or you know in early winter but but it was it was just a, a great environment you know for 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 young people like myself who who, who had ambition you know, to sort of try to hone what they they thought they had, 
uh, and develop a skill which at the time, you know, you're thinking you'd love to play football as, as a profession, but it's a long way off. But from my point of view, you know, when I joined Coventry at 15, I had no idea how quickly it would come for me to be playing in the first team. How did that call from Coventry uh, arrive, Dennis? What was the connection there? Right. So, so, so there'd been there'd been two two approaches to uh, from my services. Yeah, you know, as 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 you know, to go. One had been from Berry. Yeah, and and my my teammate in in KB Boys, Terry McDermott, he ended up at Berry. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I, I've I've read I I got a copy of Terry's book which he wrote. Yeah, about his career, and and I I, I, <laughs> I couldn't believe it when he when he wrote about his Berry days. Yeah, and was I glad that I didn't end up at Berry? You know, because it sounded horrendous to be honest. Yeah, compared to Coventry. Because when I went to Coventry, it was it all came about from a scout called. This summer, Instacart presents famous summer flavors coming to your front door, or pool, or hotel. Your grocery delivery has arrived, sir. That was faster than room service. No violins in the lobby. Oh, seriously? Anyway, sit back, relax, and get delivery in as fast as thirty minutes. Starring your favorite snacks, drinks, and more. Download Instacart for free delivery on your first three orders. Rated H for hungry audiences. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Excludes restaurants. Additional terms and fees apply. We all belong outside. We're drawn to nature. Whether it's the recorded sounds of the ocean we doze off to, or the succulents that adorn our homes, nature makes all of our lives, well, better. Despite all this, we often go about our busy lives removed from it. But the outdoors is closer than we realize. With All Trails, you can discover trails nearby and explore confidently with offline maps and on trail navigation. Download the free app today and make the most of your summer with All Trails. Alf Walton. Uh, and in the book, there's a, there's a fabulous photograph of him just sitting by the riverside with an umbrella over his head. Uh, you know, none, none of the cares of the world there. But th- this was a guy that, that, that came to the house and. Uh, knocked on the door and spoke to my mum and dad and you know we 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 went from there really but that that's how it came about in those days but i think the interesting thing about that was that i think clubs if they wanted to sign any young schoolboys they had to approach the school mm-hmm. first you know so i first of all learned about it from the headmaster yeah in the school, but I won't, I won't, I won't take you through what he said. But I'll leave that for you to read. But um, I think most people probably would know what a headmaster would say to a young lad who's only fourteen about joining a football club. <laughs> you know, it, it it wouldn't have been. Oh no, that's a good, that's a good career to go into, son. Yeah, yeah. I think your education might help you better. But that would be most headmasters around, even today. I would imagine. Yeah, but but listen. You know, the, the Alf Walton, he, he gave me the opportunity, you know, and, and I, I went to Coventry. But, you know, it was it's one of those things, Paul, you know, I'd never been away from home before. Yeah. yeah. And here I am now, travelling to Coventry, yeah, with with no idea really what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, all I know is that, well, I'm going to get a chance now for the six-week school holiday to do what I always love, and that's play football. Mm. Yeah, and and basically that's all I would have been doing anyway, because it was a school holiday. You see, I was uh, invited down during that six that six week period, and it was it was just heaven. You know, what more could a lad ask for yeah. than to be playing football every day? You know, exactly what one wanted. You know, but at fifteen, yeah, I had no idea you know, where this was going to lead to. I had a, I would, you know, I I didn't dare dream where it would lead to because you never know. But what I did, what I did think about was that, well, I've got a chance. Yeah. This is my opportunity. And so it went from there, really, you know, and those first years as an apprentice, as an apprentice, those two or three years learning the game, you know, I had good people around me. Yeah. Who uh, were good from the point of view of uh, giving me the right advice. 
you know, and, and keeping me on the straight and narrow. And uh, I think being away from home was a, probably a big help as well because I was I was never under the eye of, you know, my brothers or my sister or my mum and dad or, or even people in the area who lived around you, you know. There was no pressure. A Serbian media. Uh, but that was, to me, what football was all about. And you just then got to find a team that you know is going to, you, where you're going to win it. But I didn't know I was going to win it with Aston Villa. Yeah, not at the time, you know. But but once we I started playing and saw the quality of the players, you know, that we had in 76, uh, 76, 77, you know, it was, I just felt to myself, crikey, this team could go a long, long way. We could, we could be winning trophies every year. It didn't work out, you know. It didn't work out after winning the, the League Cup in 77. Uh, but but what happened then was there was a rebuild, as we all know, uh, by Ron, and eventually he got the side that we've spoken about before that went on to win the league in the European Cup. But no, I just felt, you know, winning a trophy at that age, even though we came second, but playing in a final, you just think to yourself, crikey, you'd like a bit more of this yeah. Yeah, and a lot more of it. Absolutely. Um, let's stay in the Coventry um early 70s at the moment. Your first game at Villa Park, I texted you the other day. Yes. And I, yes. I was looking through the England under-23s. You played six times for under-23s. You scored two goals against Holland and you was you was compared to uh, Bobby Charlton's Dennis Mortimer, the next Bobby Charlton. But, <laughs> yeah. but let's talk about the first time that you played at Villa Park. Cause it was the 7th of March, 1973, against Czechoslovakia. And Charlie George scored the only goal. Um, what was it like playing there? Because when you were at Coventry, you'd gone to Villa Park. It's a, a bigger ground. Obviously, it's England. It isn't Aston Villa. But what did the first, your first glimpses of, of that stadium feel like? And you could never have known that that nine years on, you would have been a European champion at that ground. It's quite incredible when you look at the story and the journey of a player. Paul, I, I, you know, until you reminded me of it, you know, in that, that little text you sent me, mm. I, I, I had no idea. I, I mean, I probably could have looked, if it had, Looked at my programs and looked at where you know the the where we played for the under twenty threes. You know, I I just could totally forgot. I, I I suppose I I can't really be honest with you about mm. what I thought of the ground because I don't I, I I don't remember it. It's just one of those memories. You know, it's a one night affair. It's yeah. gone. You know yeah. what I mean from that point of view. So so I I, I don't remember the night. It would have been a night game, so so the impression obviously is the floodlights. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't have thought there'd be too many people in the ground. Yeah, so so from that point of view, I wouldn't have been expecting what did happen then when I did turn up. Yeah, mm. on Boxing Day in 1975, when I turn, I come out on I come out onto the field and there's 52,000 in there, so. There's a different impression then, you know, when you see a, when you see a ground half empty, which yes. it probably was, yeah. you don't get the impression of what it is. And I, I it's quite interesting because I, it's like when I went up to watch Liverpool play at Amden Park. You know, I, I've never seen such a poor ground in my life. Mm. You know, I, I think it was a, it was like a, it was like a non-league football ground. Uh, and it was only because there was 120,000 in there when England played in the against Scotland that you thought it was a great stadium, mm. you know. But but obviously from Villa Park's point of view, yeah, it didn't make that impression because you see Coventry had a nice little ground really, you know, it was very compact, and it was it was and, and I suppose from that point of view it was uh, it was probably more homely. Uh, from that point of view, by by the fact that it looked full all the time, yeah, where you know I don't know what kind of gates Aston Villa were getting at a time when I was playing at Coventry, but it certainly wasn't fifty two thousand every week, no. you know. So so the impression of the ground, you know, the changing rooms, 
can't remember, couldn't remember them, you know, I can remember them now, where they are, where they were, but but at the time, no, I, I my, 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 my memory of playing that day uh, is, 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 is very foggy, really, yeah, but, you know, as I said, you know, the, the realisation of it struck me when, you know, I, 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 I sort of made my debut on Boxing Day and realised, crikey, you know, what a club support, what support they've got, but what a club this could be. Absolutely. And for Coventry and for Villa, you made your debuts against West Ham. Were they a lucky team to play against, Dennis? And what was your <laughs> luckiest and unluckiest grounds that you ever played in? Uh Unluckiest. I, well, you'd have, I suppose unluckiest. You'd have to look where you never won. Yeah. Is there a ground yeah. that you didn't win at? Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd have to really look through the, yeah. the records books yeah. to see that one. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking, trying to think to myself that no, I, I think everywhere we went, I think I would have at least won at least once. Yeah. But in my career. At that ground, you know, we we won at United, we won at Liverpool, you know, the top teams, we won at Leeds, uh, you know, and uh, QPR, we probably beat them, uh, you know, when they sort of went back to grass, (laughs) not when they were playing on the AstroTurf pitch, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, it was quite interesting, I, I probably, probably, I tell you what, do you remember like Bristol City? Yeah, Ashton Guy. Teams like that, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, we didn't play against them that often, but you know, a, a ground, a game like that would probably be, you know, the, I mean, they weren't in the first division that long, but probably we we didn't get the results there that we thought we should have done. Yeah, yeah, against a team like that, but against the big boys, I think most of the time we played away. You know, those who are regulars in the first division. I can't really think of a team where uh, a ground where I never won, and and I felt, you know, there's grounds where you felt when you walked out that this was the stadium. These are the stadiums you want to be playing in all the time. Obviously, Man United, Anfield, you know, uh, White Hart Lane was always another good one. See, Chelsea's was rubbish. Yeah. You know, in, in early days, you know, and Alan probably told you that many times. But you know, being it, it was an awful ground really to play on, yeah, because it was. You just seems to be so far away from the, uh, from 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 the fans, and you know it was the with the track around it, and I suppose in those days, you know, compared to what you know it became, you know, uh, it was it was a, it wasn't a, a particularly good ground to play on at Chelsea, yeah, not at all. Uh, I'm trying to think of others uh, that might have been just as bad. Derby County was. <laughs> you wanted to play a Derby County away the first game of the season if you could, <laughs> yeah, because you wouldn't want to be any later than that. Yeah, when there was a bit of grass, yeah, a bit of grass, you know. And uh, see, West West Ham was always West Ham was a tough one, but we we did get we did get some good results there as well. I got some good results with Coventry there also, you know. But uh, and now at the time, you know that in those early years, you know, and I, we talk about this in the book is about some of the players I played against, you know, the the great names, the Bobby Moores, the Jeff Hurst, the the the, the 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 Bobby Charlton's, you know, George Best. I'm on the same I'm on the same pitch as these guys, you know, the the Mike Summerbees, the Franny Lees, and all that. Uh, you know the the, the the names are just you know I, I look at the programs and I look at the team sheets and I think to myself, gosh, look at all those names there. You know, great names, great international names and all that. And the interesting thing as well is you could you could actually pronounce them all as well. You know, yes. <laughs> there's no there was no there was no, there was all it was Smiths or Joneses or or you know or Greaves or you know or Best. You know, it was it was a commentator. It was great for the commentator in those days. But nowadays, you know, you half the time you, I I don't know how to say names half the time. Yeah, I just say oh the number ten. <laughs> you know, if I was doing a summer a summarizing on a, on a radio show or something on a match, I'd be saying the number ten or the number nine. Oh, you did well there. That had a number nine. You'd be looking at the program and thinking, "Oh no, I can't read that name." Yeah. So, no, it's. Uh, but some of the names, you know, it was. Uh, I touch on them in the book as well. And uh, in those early years, 
you know, when I started getting in the first team. Uh, you'd, at the time, I, I, I write about it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. You, 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 you're out there on the pitch and you're thinking, well, I'm here for a reason. So don't be shy. Yeah. Don't be don't don't go on a football pitch now and feel as if you know you win all these superstars and all that. You know don't 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 just go out there thinking now that you're making the numbers up. Try and make something happen. You know where uh, you know people will take notice of you. And I you know I mean I did I mean you know in those early years you know before I got moved to uh, to Aston Villa. You know, there was there was talk of movement uh, for about you know previous two seasons, but it never got back to me. I only read it in the paper. You know, in, it it was like I never got called into the office by the managers uh, because in those days they did you know before because this was before Jimmy Hill came back. You see, yeah, Jimmy came back and wanted the club to be in the in the black and not in the red. Yeah, yeah? so he he just thought well there was there was a, an opportunity you know, to sell one of the up-and-coming stars that's in the team who could actually take Coventry, you know, forward and maybe win things with them. Uh, but Jimmy just felt the, the security of the club was more important. And he also saw the fact that there was lots of good young players coming through at Coventry City. So he took a chance. Uh, and if you remember it, you know, they they came up to the first division in, in uh, 1967, yeah, and they stayed in that they stayed in that league all the way through until the Premier League, and that was that was a long tenure, you know, for a club like that to have stayed in in the uh, in the first division and then you know start in the Premier League, Premier League. That was some tenure they had, you know, which was uh, which was uh, you know, I suppose in a way. You know, Jimmy Hill decided what needed to be done, and what he did now maybe gave. Coventry City that platform, Paul. You know, to to stay where they were, gave the club a bit of money, kept them in the black, and you know, and they managed then to bring some really good footballers through. Absolutely, you reference some of the funny sounding names that you wouldn't be able to pronounce in the modern game. And Paul Fletcher and I had done a Legends podcast with the Burnley centre forward Paul Fletcher. He said, "Whatever club you go to." There'd be an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman and a Welsh. Yes. You'd have the same characters. You'd have uh, the dresser. You'd have the comedian. You'd have the ladies man. A Serbian media. And you can listen to an extended version of this podcast at www.patreon.com. SRB media. A Serbian media. Hi there. I'm Amara Jones, an award-winning journalist and founder of Translash Media. I'm sure you've noticed that our political landscape is an absolute dumpster fire. That's why I started The Mess, Amara's guide to our political hellscape, to process the headlines from a trans perspective and to try to have a good laugh in it all. And I'm heading to the Democratic National Convention where I'll be bringing you daily analysis of this historic moment. So head on over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe to The Mess. See you at the DNC.